Hey, I'm Matt Caruso. In this video, we're going to take a look at exactly what the Federal Reserve is and why investors need to care. If you enjoy this video, please like, subscribe, and I'll be sure to make some more of these. My background is that I majored in economics, but I really learned mostly about the Fed uh, as a market maker and short-term trader. I was primarily focused on the precious metal stocks and other commodity stocks, so they have a direct link to everything the Federal Reserve does, even more so than the general market. Now, you may not realize it, but the Federal Reserve is probably the most powerful institution in the world. And their action moves everything from markets to currencies to the value of used cars. Everything is really linked to what the Federal Reserve does. Before we kind of jump into all of their tools, policies, and, and their power, I want to just give a little bit of a brief, brief history of you know how they came to be and uh, why sometimes it can even be controversial. So the Federal Reserve really came into existence in 1913 with the Federal Reserve Act. Uh, up until that point, the United States had no central bank. I mean, many other countries such as the United Kingdom has had the Bank of England far longer than the U.S. has had the Federal Reserve. Now, um, in 1907, there was a market panic where you know uh, there was basically a run on the banks and stock prices collapsed. Uh, as a result, actually, the original J.P. Morgan of J.P. Morgan Bank had to step in and bolster confidence in the market and had banks lend to prevent this, this market from continuing to crash. What happened was... Um, there were a number of issues that kind of went poor. There was the San Francisco earthquake the year before, which drained a lot of money out for reconstruction. There was the Boer War, where the United Kingdom was pulling a lot of gold in the banks to help pay for the war. And lastly, there was the Knickerbocker Trust, which was a big financial institution. And there were a lot of rumors going around that they had made bad bets, bad speculative bets, and they wouldn't be able to cover all of their depositors' assets. So this really caused a run on the banks. And when one fails and others start to panic, as obviously all banks are linked and lend to each other. And this started this downward spiral that, that put severe strain on the financial system. As a result of this experience that was, again, saved by J.P. Morgan, and it's a phenomenal story if ever you look into it, you know, uh, Congress got together and finally agreed to, enable, and to enact the Federal Reserve Act, which would provide the central bank of the Federal Reserve to act as a lender of last resort. So next time there's this kind of panic, the Federal Reserve actually has the power to issue new money and backstop the bank so that there's never going to be this worry of a widespread run on uh, the banking system. Now, why didn't this exist before? The United States comes from a history where um, you know there was a strong belief in checks and power. Uh, a lot of the founding fathers did not want banking institutions to have that much power over money and currency and circulation. Thomas Jefferson, one of the founding fathers, uh, third president of the United States, was particularly against the idea of a Federal Reserve or Central Bank. Uh, one of his most famous quotes is, if the American people ever allow private banks to control the issuance of their currency, first by inflation and then by deflation, the banks and corporations that will grow up around them will deprive the people of all their property until their children wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered. So as you can see, there wasn't a lot of um, love for the idea of central banks with a lot, some of the founding fathers. And there were attempts at it, but both were kind of shot down um, after just very short, brief instances of their existence. And, and really, it was the Federal Reserve Act of 1913 that formally introduced the concept of a um, central bank for the United States. Now, uh, in 1977, that their powers were expanded beyond being lenders of last resort, and they were given two mandates. One is for price stability, and the second is to maximize employment, both obviously important goals. Uh, maximizing employment, I think, is easily understood. Uh, but the idea of price stability essentially means not too much inflation or deflation. So the 1930s was a period of deflation, and, and that causes a lot of problems as assets fall. It kind of creates this vicious circle where people need to sell their assets to make up for uh, other losses that they have, and you have this downward spiral. So most central banks strive to have um, you know, no change in prices, but in reality, they, they all pretty much stick to this concept of a 2% annual price inflation, which is they consider to be price stability. Importantly, the central bank is not actually part of the government. So they are supposed to act independent. They're not supposed to fall whims to the desires of any one political party or the government in, in total. And they're not supposed to be there to directly lend money to the government. I mean, that would basically break the confidence that the central bank is, you know, maintaining price stability. If, if the central bank would just constantly print money to feed government spending, that would cause a lot of inflation as people lose faith in the value of the currency, seeing that it can just be printed. Now, this is what happens in inflationary period. This is what happened in the 1970s when uh, Richard Nixon broke the gold uh, 
back currency of the United States dollar and, and floated it to a fiat currency. So it's now really just backed by faith in the US government. But there are a lot of tools that the central bank has to reach their mandates of price stability and, and maximizing employment. How they go about doing this is very important because it affects everything from stock prices to home values to uh, the number of people who are employed to the number of people that are laid off, how many businesses survive or fail. So, I mean, they have the powers that they have to reach their mandates are very, very far reaching. So let's take a look at the key tools that the Federal Reserve can use to reach its dual mandate of price stability and maximum employment. So the first one is maintaining the discount rate and the federal funds rate. This is really the rate that banks will lend to each other or that they will lend to the Federal Reserve or borrow from the Federal Reserve overnight. This is an important rate. You may think the overnight rate is not important, but all other interest rates are basically based off of what this overnight rate is. So for example, if the overnight borrow rate for banks increases from 1% to 3%, well, they're going to be charging their customers more than what it costs them to borrow at. So the prime rate goes up. The prime rate is you know, the, the, pretty much the best rate that they'll charge their, their best customers. And um, if you're anything less than the best customer, you're going to be paying a premium to the prime rate. So mortgages or riskier borrowers are going to be paying prime plus a certain percentage. So as you see, whatever the Federal Reserve sets as the federal funds rate or the discount rate actually impacts a lot of interest rate values all across society. This could also impact things such as your the, the finance rate for a new car or you know your, your line of credit. So there, there's just an endless number of interest rates that are affected by the discount federal funds rate. The second important tool by the, uh, set, the Federal Reserve is the uh, reserve requirements. So all banks work on a fractional reserve system. By that, what it means is if you put $100 in the bank, the bank can actually turn around and lend more than $100. So they don't actually hold all of your cash as an asset. I think most people are aware of this at this point. But the amount of cash that they have to maintain on hand in case you ask for your money back is set by the Federal Reserve. Now, um, everyone tends to think that money and credit are the same thing. They spend the same, whether you use your credit card or whether someone lends you $100. I mean, if you go to the store, it'll work the same to purchase something. But, you know, you know, the cash that you use is actual money issued by the Federal Reserve. And whatever you use on your credit card or borrow from a friend is actually credit. It needs to be paid back. So this credit is directly linked to what reserve requirements are set at the banks. The lower the amount of reserves that banks need to hold, the more they can lend, the more, the more they can take from that $100 you deposit and lend out to other people. And so this is very powerful. So the, the controlling of the reserve requirement basically has a major impact on how much credit exists in the economy. Now, this may not sound like a big deal, but there's actually much more credit in the economy and that's used for buying and selling than there is money. So uh, this increase or decrease in credit will completely change the amount of money that's sloshing around and how much is available for, for building new homes or buying new cars or purchasing new products or financing new companies. So it's a very, very powerful tool to set reserve requirements. The next tool the Federal Reserve has is forward guidance. So because the Federal Reserve is so powerful, simply saying what they think needs to happen or what they plan to do can actually set in motion a series of events that will bring it to, to its existence. So if the Federal Reserve is concerned about inflation, simply saying that they plan to act to bring inflation down and that they intend to raise interest rates uh, to get that job done will in fact have investors worry, which will have them sell their assets, which will bring down asset prices, which will somewhat reduce the uh, likelihood of inflation to, to keep going higher. So just forward guidance is an important tool even though you wouldn't think so on the surface, but again, their power is so well respected that forward guidance is something they use actually to set market expectations. So the last tool, which is a fairly new tool, which came into existence in 2009 as a result of the financial crisis is quantitative easing. This is a little bit more controversial of a tool. This is actually, uh, the Federal Reserve will buy bonds in the open market by either the US government or mortgage backed securities. And they do this by actually literally printing new money and going out and buying these bonds. So they do this to basically lower the cost for mortgages, lower the cost of what the federal, the, uh, federal government needs to borrow at. So essentially allowing for more debt to be created. It also has a large impact on the rest of the debt market. I mean, if the government debt is at a lower rate, corporate debt will come down and all you know debt instruments are fairly linked to each other. Now, this is controversial to some extent because again, the 
Federal Reserve is supposed to be an independent agency, an independent actor outside of the federal government. People don't want um, the worry that, hey, the Federal Reserve is just here to print money and just hand it over to the government because historically, and if you go back through history, if, whenever that's the case, um, it, it tends to be abused by politicians. And then after there is excessive amount of inflation and um, as a result, people lose faith in the currency and that causes severe problems within the country. So quantitative easing is one that has to be done very mindfully uh, to not create that perception that the Federal Reserve is actually directly funding the government and that they're actually trying to work just towards their dual mandate. So with just these four tools, the Federal Reserve has an immense amount of power. By setting short-term interest rates, they can basically uh, set what everyone throughout society will pay on a short-term uh, basis for interest rates, even though they're just setting the rate for banks and the interbank lending. By uh, using quantitative easing, they can increase the money supply by printing money and buying bonds, also affecting the longer term interest rate throughout society and even what the government will have to, have to borrow at. By setting reserve requirements, they can set how much credit will likely be created through society. This affects everything. This, this affects the ability for a new company to be created. This affects the ability for current companies operating, whether they can stay with the same number of employees, with the same size of operations, whether they can expand operations or whether they need to shut down less profitable branches of their company. Uh, this sets the price for cars, new cars, used cars. It, it, it affects the amount of demand and cash available to purchase new products. And it directly affects stocks through the uh, amount of capital available to go to the stock market, as well with a higher opportunity cost if rates go up what investors are willing to pay for stocks when they can get um, higher interest rate levels with little to no risk. So the Federal Reserve has an immense amount of power. It affects the health of financial health of the government, of companies, of citizens, uh, employment levels, the likelihood for a company to survive or fail. And so it's just an incredibly powerful institution. So this is why so few people really understand all of the different elements and the different tools that the Federal Reserve can use in the market, but why it's just so critical that investors understand what the Federal Reserve is thinking, what they're doing, and how it'll impact the economy and the stock market as a whole. Now that you understand what the Federal Reserve is, why they're so important, and how powerful they truly are, in future videos, we'll take a look at all the individual tools how the Federal Reserve comes to its decision as to how it should set these tools or move these different tools around and use them throughout the economy and how this directly affects and impacts investors and investors' decision-making. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you have any other specific questions about the Fed, please leave them in the comments below and I'll try to address them in future videos. I plan to make this kind of a series on the Federal Reserve. Uh, markets are incredibly complex. If you'd like to learn more about my process and how I interpret markets day to day, you can visit my website at carusoinsights.com. You can follow me on Twitter at trader underscore M Caruso. And we'll talk again soon about the Federal Reserve and how it impacts stocks. See you then.